they were then put up as, as candidates in those constituencies. So what are you actually addressing? You've taken the 60 seats and said, okay, right, we'll sideline women again, they've got their 60 seats, fine, we don't actually take them as a serious, you know, a serious presence, so we'll give them, they've got their 60 seats, do we really need them to stand? No, we'll take one of our male candidates. So you need to look at that issue as well. Well, <laughs> I think let's give them a full name. Okay. Well, I think the argument of usefulness is a, is a double-edged sword. Mm. We have been run by men as an economy. Mm. What have we benefited? We have had a president who is a man, mm. vice presidents who are men. We have had a speaker of parliament who is a man. We have had brigadier generals who are men. We have had uh, reserve bank governors. To the last one, they have been men. If usefulness was a measure of giving, being given public positions, all these men will not have positions. So we should not uh, uh, pretend that men have been useful in this economy. Men have been useless in this country. <laughs> right now, we have men, a whole vice president who is being chased by a dancing woman, uh, Travis. <laughs> so where is the usefulness of, of men in terms of, 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 of the politics of, of the day and the utility value to Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe is useless because of other salient factors to do with lack of accountability, lack of, uh, of uh, proper management of economic system, and lack of good common sense in the guys that are supposed to be leading this economy. And you cannot blame the Skiste women who are in parliament for the failure and the total chaos that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. We probably would be in a better position had we made a quota system for even for the executive positions. Right, so usefulness is not a value. Uh, on top of the, uh, of the 60 which I give uh, for free, and I call it the COSI, you are equally allowed to contest in the 210 election uh, constituencies in the country. This is a, bo a, bo a thing bonus you are being g g g g g given. The 210 constituencies, women are allowed to contest because Sarama Hawk who is a member of parliament, who is a woman representing East, you've got uh, Jessie Manjo, she represents a constituency. So this is something being given to you, okay, and nothing stops you from contesting in the 210 and winning them. Statistically, when I was member of parliament in Urungwe, uh, West, 66% of the women voted for me. 66% of the women voted for me. I won because of women. Is, is, women have a choice too to identify who should lead them. Just because you're a woman, it does not mean you're an automatic leader. Leadership is more than that. Are you able to deliver? Are you able to serve the people? This is where the aspect of merit comes in. I went to a primary election against a woman when I was in Zanu PF. She had 200 votes, I had 9,000. Went to a real election which I talked to you about, 60% voted for me. So to me, we've got to ask ourselves, it is their democratic right. Don't infringe on the women's democratic right and by saying they're underrepresented and we must come up with these terms, it is their democratic right too to choose who should lead them. You're talking about the Reserve Bank governor or the president or any echelon of power being men. But they've been put there by women. So when these women are, vo are, are, are voting for them, are you telling me they, that they don't know what they're doing? So let's, let us not have a situation where women okay, are using their democratic right to pick who they believe must lead them at the end of the day. You had Mayim Juru, who was the vice president, the first woman vice president. She was outstanding. I did not see women toy toying. Saying, the, you know, and, 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 and Honorable Nangagwa, Okay. Was, re, was, was then replaced here. Where were the thing women? Underperformance and, uh, and, and undervaluing yourself cannot cause the thing state to, 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 to use resources. It cannot. You have the aspect of people living with disability, for example. To me, that's more of a better cause than thing women, where they should be empowered. If you look at the section, uh, section uh, uh, the one uh, 76, well, uh, section 7, 17 of the Constitution, gender balance. There should be gender balance. Where there's no gender balance, why have you not taken the matter to court to challenge the Constitution and say, the Constitution says that we must be there. If you go to section 80, there are the rights of women. 
So why also from a legislative point of view, from a constitutional point of view, are you not pushing your agenda? But anything which has an imbalance, you are quick to say gender, 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 which has led us to a bloated uh, parliament, which has been a, a waste of taxpayers' money. If we believe that we must have women representative, I think demographically I've stated that, we're very clear about that. It must be results oriented. What we want is people who are competent, who have merit, and women are also educated amongst those who are also contesting at the end of the day. You having not faith in each other must not cause the whole state apparatus to think forward. That's, and so he ends on the, the state apparatus. Does the state not have obligations? Does the, those who have direct responsibilities to the state not have obligations? But because you haven't been given space, I'll give you an opportunity. Okay. Thanks, Saki. Um, I think personally to me it's insulting to be told that I need help to succeed. I need a quota system in place for me to then succeed. I didn't uh, start to hear about quota systems until I was at university level. So clearly I succeeded on my own. This is a patriarchy trap. Why I say it's a patriarchy trap that now as we speak, I think lived example as we speak right now, Women are being relegated to those 60 seats. They are not going in political parties. They are not given enough uh, chances to then part campaign and participate and win, win on merit, mm -hmm. like he's talking about. So this is a patriarchy trap, where then it boxes women. Women's league, quota system, and we are trapped. We are equally capable of running for those seats and winning them on merit basis. And must has talked about um, issues of uh, AU and recognizing uh, this that there is need to be a quota system, and I think I think let's go to the issues. Let's let's interrogate uh, who has benefited in this quota system. Personally, I think it's the middle class and your political elites. It's not addressing any inequality or injustice. Where are the women? Where is my grandmother from Gurule? Where is she? And who is representing her? And it, it has actually created another layer of inequality because it's your middle class women, the educated, and the patronage system. And these are the stories that we talk behind closed doors, that such and such a woman has to bend this certain man for them to then qualify to the PRC. And you're subjecting women to abuse. Yes. You are subjecting to the patronage, right. patronage system. Thank you. So the affirmative action subjects women to abuse. There is no need. Why should the state provide support for women to get the response? Well, look, look, uh, I think uh, people forget the historical context. And mm -hmm. my, my colleagues here are missing the point, not only by a centimeter, but by a mile. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> you see, you know, in 1991, we promulgated the Age of Majority Act. Mm -hmm to make women adults. So in other words, we have a society that until it fought independence, but still believed women were minors. Mm. It was only after uh, we put in that act that women were recognized as adults. And it, it was only then, after independence, that we recognized and we had to use the law to force these men and these other women to believe that even themselves to believe that they could be adults and uh, that they could then open an account, live on their own, be divorced, get elected and so forth and so forth. Before that, you needed the permission of a man. You had to be married to become an adult. So therefore, the positive influence of the law in terms of advancing the cause of women is a no-brainer. We have to use it. We have to get select and say we reserve these seats for women, we reserve these seats for the quota system to enable us to fast track the dense fog of lack of knowledge, uh, lack of understanding, and backwardness that exists in a patriarchal dominated society. Where even a judge, the judge president, who is a woman, the former judge president, the head of ZEC, had to go and kneel. <laughs> They had to go and kneel before a man who is just a president whom she's supposed to appoint. And she says it's a reflex. She can't get rid of a cultural reflex. In other words, we made a mistake. We should have included in the Constitution that if the chair of ZEC 
becomes a woman, she must not be in the habit of kneeling <laughs> before men. It is not part of the process. We therefore have to absolutely, absolutely liberate a, a people. We, it's not only about uplifting the women. It's about also detoxicating the patriarchal mindset that exists in the men who think it's normal to have other people kneel before them when they are uh, 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 fulfilling their constitutional obligations. Fantastic. Miss Masters? Uh, oh, thank you. Fantastic. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> just, just, can you just hold for just a second? Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I like the fact that he uses uh, Justice Makarao. So why then blame women? Why, why, why then blame men? She's in power. She's the chairman of the Zimbabwe Commission. She goes and kneels. So what has the thing system done wrong when she's already in a position of authority? So why would you blame men? We are liberating both. We are liberating the woman who thinks that who has been culturally imposed to believe that every time she sees a man, she has to kneel. We have to liberate the man who expects homage, who expects worshipping, who expects to be worshipped simply because he has a different sexual organ. Um, I, was going to say, I was going to say, look, when we use affirmative action for any other reason other than for women, say it's based on race um, and other issues, class, whatever it may be, we're fine with that. We're fine with affirmative action around that. We know it's needed. I mean, obviously in South Africa, BE was needed because you really had to address a very, you know, striking imbalance. It's just that when it comes to women, there's an issue. Let's not, we, what we need to do is then let's interrogate the implementation of the affirmative action. Yes, that's a flawed process. I'm even going to agree with it. But that does not mean it's not needed, okay? A flawed process, what you then need to do is let's talk about then how do we take care of this flawed process. And yes, I've talked to the women who've gone through, you know, who've gone through parliament, they have no constituency, they have very little power in terms of the additional seats. So even if I was arguing for, and I am arguing for the affirmative action, I would say, okay, let's re-look at the model of affirmative action. I wouldn't say discard it, I would say re-look at it. Um, you talked about going to university. The problem is that many women were being excluded. So there's affirmative